Good morning. Please turn to Hosea, actually the end of chapter 11, but the study will be over chapter 12 mainly. I do want you to know that my absences have not been due to fear of the remainder of the book of Hosea. <laughs> I mentioned last time that I chose to, uh, to study the book in the first place because I couldn't wait to get to chapter 11, and perhaps some of you have speculated that after that lesson I simply cut and ran. But <laughs> I'm here, and the entire book is the Word of God, and so it's open in our hands again. And we can look back up into chapter 11 and perhaps uh, see those thrilling expostulations of the Lord. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? How can I make you like these random uh, peoples, these pagan peoples? My heart is turned over within me. All my compassions are kindled. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. And we're reminded, as we uh, did last time uh, out of Romans chapter 3, that our God is a Savior. He is a Redeemer of sinful people, and He is both just uh, that is, he uh, remains holy and just and punishes uh, sin, but he's also the justifier because he took upon himself uh, the judgment due to sinners like us, bearing the penalty in his own son. And, he, and we know he always secures a remnant who, because of his inscrutable grace, are reconciled to God. We're reconciled through the death of his son. He roars like a lion. That's what verse 10 says. And his sons and his daughters come trembling uh, to him. That's the experience of every believer. He roars like a lion and we come trembling to him. Well, it's a beautiful picture, but now uh, we come to this awkwardly placed verse 12 of chapter 11, which uh, rightly uh, most think uh, several versions place is not the last verse of chapter 11, but the first verse of the next chapter. And this seesaw prophecy descends down again. And I hope you don't mind me uh, using the mundane illustration of a seesaw, uh, the ups and downs of a seesaw, but the image keeps coming into my Head as I read through the book of Hosea, uh, most of the time there is an 800-pound gorilla uh, on one end keeping the nation of, of Israel fastened to the bottom of their spiritual experience. And we're back to it again in verse 12 with lies and deceit and unruliness against God holding them there at the bottom. It won't stay there. Uh, today it will, uh, but it, it won't stay there forever. A course reversal is still to come, and even in the pronouncement of judgment uh, found in these verses today, there is an underlying appeal to return to the Lord and be the people their God called them to be. So let's read it, beginning with, in my version, verse 12 of chapter 11. Ephraim surrounds me with lies and the house of Israel with deceit. Judah is also unruly against God, even against the Holy One who is faithful. I'm not going to say more than this, that uh, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, phrases that differently, and therefore some versions of the Bible put Judah in a, in a better light here. But this is the way we're going to interpret it. He is condemning Judah as well. Verse 1 of 12, Ephraim feeds on wind and pursues the east wind continually. He multiplies lies and violence. Moreover, he makes a covenant with Assyria and oil is carried to Egypt. Uh, the Lord also has a dispute with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. 
In the womb, he took his brother by the heel, and in his maturity, he contended with God. Now, you'll recognize uh, allusions to uh, the book of Genesis here. Uh, Yes, verse 4, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He found him at Bethel, and there he spoke with us. Even the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord is his name. Therefore, return to your God. Observe kindness and justice and wait for your God continually. There really should be a break uh, here before verse 7. A merchant, it's in the margin of your Bible, a a Canaanite, literally. Canaanites came to stand for merchants. That was what they did. So a Canaanite in whose hands are false balances. He loves to oppress And Ephraim said, surely I have become rich. I have found wealth for myself. In all my labors, uh, they will find in me no iniquity, which would be sin. But I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt. I will make you live in tents again, as in the days of the appointed festival. I have also spoken to the prophets, and I gave numerous visions, and through the prophets I gave parables. Is there iniquity in Gilead? Surely they are worthless. In Gilgal, they sacrifice bulls. Yes, their altars are like the stone heaps beside the furrows of the field. So I'm not going to have time to say it later, but what he's saying there is they're making so many pagan uh, altars, uh, idols throughout the land, uh, there, is, there are as many of them as there are piles of stone next to a furrowed field because they've cleared the land and they pile the stones up in, in these piles. So that's what he's saying in, in verse 11. 12. Now Jacob fled to the land of Aram, and Israel worked for a wife, and for a wife he kept sheep. But by a prophet the Lord brought Israel from Egypt, and by a prophet, he was kept. Ephraim has provoked a bitter anger, so his Lord will leave his blood guilt on him and bring his reproach to him. I want to say, I I am going to go a little bit over because we get a little later start, but I'm going to try not to go very much over because I want you to have time to talk and then go in. But I want to make three introductory observations. First, in our reading, uh, we can see how this is an easily identifiable section within the book of Hosea, including the final verse 12 of chapter 11. Experts in rhetoric and literature uh, observe a, a technique, a device called an inclusio, and you've heard Bible teachers talk about inclusio before. Uh, that writers employ in order to give emphasis and structure in their thought. It's to make similar assertions at the beginning and at the end of a section in order to give emphasis to them, to, to, to mark them off. And here in verse 11 of chapter 12, at the very beginning, uh, there is the now repeated accusation against the nation Israel. They're a lying, deceitful people. Uh, made grossly apparent by the holy and faithful one against whom uh, they have conducted themselves. And then at the end, in the final verse of chapter uh, 12, verse 14, uh, their provocation is shown for the effect on their Lord. It's provoked him to bitter anger. And notice, too, secondly, Uh, what one writer called the universality of their failure. It's not just Ephraim. It's not just the house of Israel who is guilty. Judah is now brought in for mention. The brunt of Hosea's uh, prophecies was aimed at the northern kingdom. We've talked about that in our study. Uh, Israel was the primary audience or target. Uh, They were advanced in their spiritual apostasy, their spiritual adultery. And whereas the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, though flawed itself, nevertheless trailed Israel in their path uh, to abandoning uh, God. And Israel would be the first to fall into exile to uh, to Assyria, but Judah would follow soon after, falling to Israel. 
uh, uh, the Babylonians. So we read here that Judah is also unruly against God. And again, in verse 2, uh, that the Lord also has a dispute with Judah. <clears throat> but there's a bit of a history lesson here for both Israel and Judah. And this is the third thing uh, with the biographical sketch of the great father of them both, uh, Jacob. Look back and learn. That was Derek Kidner's uh, heading to this part of uh, the book of Hosea. Look back and learn. Here in our verses is an appeal to the perseverance that was the hallmark of their ancient standard bearer, Jacob. And the question that seems to hover over the entire section, I hope you, you caught it, is who are you? Uh, are you not the children of Jacob? Then act like Jacob act, acted. Uh, it, it reminds of Paul, doesn't it? In, in Romans chapter 6, Dan mentioned this in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, uh, when, he, when he said, therefore, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ, and quit acting like you're not that way. Be who uh, you are. So Jacob wrestled with the angel and prevailed, and that's what you must do. Also, okay. What do we got? <laughs> I know you're trying to turn it off as fast as you can. Okay, okay, okay. That's okay, Rich. I will not have you competing. No. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Yes. Or the International Space Station. So he begins. Here we go. Verse 12. Ephraim surrounds me with lies and the house of Israel with deceit. Judah is also unruly against God, even against the Holy One who is faithful. Ephraim feeds on wind and pursues the east wind continually. He multiplies lies and violence. He makes these covenants with these, these nations. Why do we lie? Why do we seek to deceive? It is the most human of sins uh, to seek to hide something that we are ashamed of, to elevate ourselves to a place or a position that's not real, uh, by subterfuge to gain an advantage that somehow we think is necessary for us. I say it's the most human. It was the first reaction to the first sin in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve sinned. What did they do? They hid. It was a form of deception. They lied. Well, I was afraid because I was naked. Uh, the woman that you gave me, it, 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 it's her fault. And just as in that first display of deceit in Eden, the, the, the urge to be deceitful is absurd. Think about it. They were in the garden with God. So it was absurd. And here Hosea addresses the equally absurd actions of Israel. Ephraim surrounds me with lies. Surrounds me. God was in their midst. Uh, he says it there in verse 12. God, the Holy One who is faithful. So there they were. We might say here, here we are. Uh, with all the circumstances facing them, with all the decisions to make every day, but with God Almighty at their side, his holiness utterly distinguishing him from the mundane predicaments of the world and the peoples he has created, and yet faithful to us, but rather than banking on his unlimited resources, the veritable feast of blessings that he promises, Hosea says the people feed on wind, on the east wind continually. It's the picture is of a people running here and there in vain, making it all up as they go along, uh, resorting to worthless alliances with pagan nations like Egypt and Assyria, when all along, 
the one who had promised them the land in the very beginning is calling out to them to rely only upon him so that they don't have to lie. Uh, they don't have to be uh, deceitful. It's absurd. In chapter 7, uh, remember this, you'll remember this, Hosea likened them to a silly dove without sense, calling out to Egypt, going to Assyria. Here is a lesson uh, for me. Here is a lesson for each, each of us. Our lying and our deceit are in vain. The disguises that we manufacture, that we pretend are making us secure, are useless strivings. You know, we're susceptible to this. Uh, in our business, within our families, I don't want to say the truth. I want to manipulate it to get me out of this fix on why this happened. So they're useless. In fact, worse, everyone in this part of the world knew not to pursue the east wind, the east wind which blew, uh, propelled from the hot uh, desert, uh, miserable, if not dangerous. That's where the east wind came from, kind of like Dallas in the summertime. I was telling Dennis earlier, I about died yesterday on my walk. But deceit is like playing with fire. That's what he's saying. It will burn you. And besides, we're not deceiving, our, deceiving God, but we're deceiving ourselves. He sees all. He knows all and is grieved that we resort to methods and lies that bring us no advantage in fact, but only deny us the blessing of seeing our holy God take care of us apart from our lies. But now, if we are to understand our passage, we must take careful note of the subtlety of the prophet in verse 2 in bringing before his audience the specter of Jacob. Jacob was their venerable father. Uh, we would only diminish the significance of that important fact were we to compare it to, say, George Washington's impact on the American story. Jacob was more than that to both the nation and to God, who so often referred to himself. God did. I am the God of Jacob. He was not a perfect man. We know that from our uh, lessons in Genesis. From We've heard it in this room over the last few years. But Hosea introduces him at this juncture as a reminder to the people of this day that of what can happen when a man and God vigorously engage with one another. Jacob was a man who, despite his shortcomings, desperately sought the blessing of God. And by grace, he prevailed. Cannot now those who take their name from Jacob prevail also? Only if they humbly own up to their own complete dependence on his grace and mercy in their own condition. Three events in Jacob's life are alluded to here. Four, if we include verse 12. The first was at his birth. In the womb, Hosea says, he took his brother by the heel. That account is found in Genesis chapter 25. And it's where Jacob got his name, which means one who takes by the hill, or one who supplants. Because as you remember, he was one of two twin brothers. Esau was born first, and then Jacob, holding on to Esau's hill. And as Hosea frames the historical reference, it's intended for us to understand that even in the womb, this is very interesting, uh, even in the womb, this yet unborn child was earnestly seeking the divine blessing, which by right would have gone to Esau, to the firstborn. And you may think, well, that's stretching it just a little bit to think that the un unborn baby about to come out of the womb had it in his mind of, of supplanting 
already until you remember that God had previously explained to his mother Rebecca that the twins in her womb were two nations and against custom and practice, the older would serve the younger. In other words, this was God's work, uh, not the active volition of an emerging infant. As Calvin observed, it was then God who guided the hand of the infant so that it would be understood whose choice had determined the blessing to come. And ever since that time, ever since then, God had continually reminded Israel, the nation born out of the patriarch, that they had not received their status as a nation by their own virtue, but on account of God's good pleasure. It was not the result of any superiority residing in the people, but only the divine the design. And I know I'm talking very quickly and I'm doing it on purpose. It's very much like the case of Jeremiah, uh, whose call we were reminded of by Dan last week came before he was even born. Before I formed you in the womb, God said, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. In like manner, Jacob was consecrated before he was even born. Uh, later, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9 would illustrate the mysterious truth of divine election by pointing to this same landmark of uh, birth. Before the children were even born, Paul will write, uh, quoting from Genesis, quoting from Malachi two, 1, 1 verse 2, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it. Now I say Hosea was framing this brief bit of history. He was framing it with other landmark events in Jacob's life. If in the womb he took hold of his brother's heel, Hosea goes on to say in verse 3 and into verse uh, four, and in his maturity, he contended with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. So this is a reference to Genesis chapter 32 and the circumstances in which he received his second name, Israel. Alone at night, Genesis 32, a man uh, the text says, wrestled with Jacob until daybreak. And later in the account, uh, Jacob will say that he had seen God face to face. So we must surmise that the one whom Hosea uh, here first calls God and then angel immediately after was the pre-incarnate son of God. But Jacob wrestled with him and would not allow him to prevail and then insisted that he would not let go of him until this man, this angel, blessed him. And the angel told Jacob, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Israel, uh, the word means something like he strives. So the one who had unwittingly uh, grabbed his brother's heel at birth and who later, remember, quite willingly uh, duped him out of his birthright, the, the red stuff, and uh, now fought for a much nobler end, the blessing of God upon him. Uh, Jacob, now Israel, uh, was one who strove to overcome in order that he might know God and enjoy his blessing. Dr. Walke described the encounter as the defining moment of Jacob's life. And then the next event from his life that Hosea cites is his previous to that encounter with God at Bethel in verse 4. He found him at Bethel, and there he spoke with us. Even the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord is his name. That account was from Genesis 28. And the description of Jacob's dream with the ladder reaching up into heaven. 
this dream came from God. And so it seems more likely that it was God who found Jacob at Bethel and not, as my version has it, Jacob finding God. So Hosea's little bit of history here has made its way to the place where Jacob met God. It was a a time, if you think back to it, fleeing from Esau, it was a a time of, of, of great difficulty, of uncertainty, and I would imagine great stress for he was, in, in effect, fleeing for his life. Uh, he would never see his, his mother again. He was about to embark on what would become a 20-plus year ordeal uh, filled with frustration, treachery, and ultimately great blessing. But God prepared him for it all that night, affirming to Jacob the same promises. He gave him the same promises he had given to his father and to his grandfather and promising him, perhaps most importantly, that he would be with him through whatever he would face. He would keep him and bring him one day back to the land of promise. Jacob met with the God of grace there at Bethel, pure unmerited grace, and as if to emphasize that, in verse 5 now, Hosea repeats the name of God. He is Yahweh. He is the Lord, the God of hosts. The Lord is his name. It was the faithful, covenant-keeping, all-powerful God in command of all the hosts of heaven and earth who had met with him And recognizing that, Jacob put a name on that place. It was Bethel. It was the house of God. Now remember, Hosea had a sharp tongue, and he had made reference to Bethel uh, before in our prophecies. Uh, The nation had turned that that city into a center of pagan a worship complete with a calf who was their God, an idolatrous, an idolatrous calf. And so in chapters 4 and 5 and 10, uh, Hosea referred to the city as Beth Avon, Beth Avon, the house of iniquity, not the house of, of God. But now he calls it by its correct name, for it was no calf that had met with Jacob that night, but Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth, the one true God. Jacob had carried that knowledge and sense of awe with him throughout his life. It was a long history of grace. And one day, Jacob did return to the land, and he bowed in prayer, and he said, O God of my father Abraham and of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper you. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. And so in verse 6, look there, Hosea makes the application, therefore, return to your God. That's the same word. Here's his application to the people. Return to your God. Observe kindness and justice and wait for your God continually. Be like Jacob. Be who you are. Be the seed of Jacob. It's in the Lord God alone that you have security and significance and a meaningful existence. Hold fast like Jacob, for you're his son. You're his daughter. Return to your God and cease chasing after false gods. It's the great temptation of every person to seek the meaning and pleasure and security elsewhere other than in the one who calls us by name. And Jacob's imperfect life, uh, summarized so briefly here by highlights, reminds us that Hosea's message is not a quick fix uh, remedy. Uh, Jacob was a schemer. He was a supplanter and himself not above seeking answers outside the will of God. But you know the story. He grew 
in faith. And his own return to God took place over years and years and years, yet he never lost his faith in the promises of God. He never abandoned the object of his faith and betrayed who he was. Sadly, uh, that was not true of the people Hosea now addresses, uh, signaled in verse 7 with the single descriptive title Canaanite, a merchant, a Canaanite in whose hands are false balances. He loves to oppress. And Ephraim said, surely I've become rich. I've found wealth for myself. In all my labors, they will find in me no iniquity, which would be sin. Now, if you think about it in a certain way, uh, Canaan, Canaan was Israel's home. Uh, the Canaanites were merchants, and they were known for their dishonesty. I guess that goes with the turf because it's the view held still today by many that merchants are, are dishonest. It's like a running joke we have in the real estate community that people love. I don't like it. I had a notorious client who used to say it all the time. How can you tell when a real estate broker is lying? His lips are moving. Get it? <laughs> but we're to understand here that Hosea is saying that Israel inhabiting the land of Canaan has become like the Canaanites of old, dishonest merchant, merchants. And that's, there's a sad irony to that. The Lord had brought the nation out of captivity in Egypt and brought them into this land inhabited by a, a filthy, iniquitous people in order that he might uh, bring Israel into the land and create Israel there. But what had happened instead was that Canaan had turned Israel into Canaan. The world can be a, a dangerous place in more ways than one. We may set out to transform the world and wake up one day to find the world has transformed us. I knew somebody in college like that, but the Lord didn't let him stay that way long. It's a dangerous position to be in because the Lord will often let you prosper while you're there. That's the meaning of verse 8. Uh, Israel had become relatively wealthy in the 8th century, yet their wealth had been ill-gotten. But the Lord allowed them to skate by for a period. But now he has something to say to them. Verse 9, I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt. I will make you live in tents again as in the days of the appointed festival. I have also spoken to the prophets, and I gave numerous visions, and through the prophets I gave parables. I think there's a simple solution to understanding these last verses, and that's what we'll do now. Uh, it corresponds to what Israel has been accused of first, that they have become rich, but by dishonest means, and so the Lord will take care of that. He'll bring them back into the wilderness where they will once more live in tents, and that's not going to be necessarily a bad thing. It's just what they need, and they'll learn to rejoice anew over God's good gifts as they once did in the days of old. The second thing is their protestation of innocence, uh, but the prophets uh, negated uh, those protests, for God sent the prophets for the very reason that the people were guilty, and they needed to re repent. Maybe it's just me, but one of the attributes of God that I love the most and that I spend a lot of time in my prayer giving thanks for is God's patience, his long-suffering. One thing that emerges from this chapter is the Lord's long and gracious work to watch over his people in the face of their unbelief. I will now allure her, he said in chapter 2, and bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. This is something similar to that, though sadly, <clears throat> they continue to stubbornly reject his kindness as the 11th verse attests. Verse 12 is difficult to understand. 
I don't mean that we don't understand the reference to Jacob fleeing and working for a wife, keeping sheep for a wife. That's the history. But its place here, uh, though typical of Hosea's style, is, is hard to discern. And perhaps it's merely to highlight the difference between the dreary work Jacob had to do in keeping sheep for a wife and how the Lord kept Israel. He did it by a prophet. He did it by a man of God through whom he spoke. And that's why I labeled, if you have your outline, that's why I labeled in the outline these verses 9 through 13, the voice of God. God spoke to his people. If only they had listened. Alas, they did not. As the final verse attests, they had no appetite for God's truth. And now the dreadful consequences are put on display, the Lord will leave his blood guilt on him and bring back his reproach to him. That punishment appears final, but Paul will speak to that in Romans chapter 11. It's not final. Well, there are good lessons in this sad chapter. We've highlighted some of them already. We must not lie or be deceitful. We need to be truth tellers. We need to persevere like Jacob in pursuing God. We need to wait on the Lord and not find our fulfillment in the world. But surely the message that impresses in this last section of the chapter is that God speaks to us. And we have the inestimable privilege of hearing the voice of God. Isaiah chapter 1 Verse 2, listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, the Lord speaks. The Lord speaks. The Lord desired through Hosea that the nation of Israel hear his voice and heed it. One day they will. What was it that Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and, and they follow me? And the father said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. The church is to be a listening body. That's who we're supposed to be, a listening body. God is not silent. And I would refer you to Psalm 19, but not read it right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your patience with us. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you are with us. You keep your promises. Thank you that you have not abandoned us, uh, but you have uh, been a God of great grace and mercy. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for the word of God that we hold in our hands. And as we go from here, uh, many of us, to hear the exposition out of uh, Jeremiah, Lord, will you open our hearts to hear and heed uh, your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.